Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are speaking with the author of Paradigm Lost, From Two-State Solution to One-State Reality. Dr. Ian Lustig holds the best W. Heyman Chair Emeritus in the Political Science Department at the University of Pennsylvania. He has published widely in the fields of Middle East politics, comparative politics, social science methodology, U.S. foreign and national security policy, and social science-based computer simulation. Uh, Dr. Lustig, welcome to Talk World Radio. Wonderful to be here with you. Uh, wonderful to have you on. Thanks for the work you've been doing and for this book. Um, why uh, is a two-state solution no longer a real option at all? The fundamental uh, reason for that is that uh, Israel which really holds most of the cards to determine whether or not a Palestinian state could come into existence because it has controlled all the territory that was a candidate for this statehood. Uh, Israel has tr fundamentally changed over the last uh, 50 years, especially the last 25 or 30 years. Uh, it changed from a country that was founded and operated mostly on social democratic principles uh, which never had a complete solution to the Arab problem, but was in principle open to sharing the country with Palestinians. It's changed from that kind of a country to a country that is dominated, as we can see by the last uh, results of the last election, by ultranationalism, a very militant kind of commitment to Jewish particularism, uh, very strong influence of religious fundamentalists in the government, uh, in other words, for Americans, you can think of it this way. In the 1950s and 60s, Israel was kind of a blue state, kind of a Connecticut or New Jersey in, in many ways. It then, in the 1980s, became a kind of uh, uh, purple state, 1980s and 90s, like Ohio or Pennsylvania. One election, it's red, the next one is blue, next one is red, the next one is blue, Likud, labor, labor, Likud, divide the country, make peace with the Palestinians, no, annex it completely, those are our enemies, We God gave us the whole land, no, back to negotiations. That was when it was a purple state. It's now deep red. It's Oklahoma, it's Idaho, it's Nebraska. Uh, now, it doesn't mean that it will always be deep red, but it is now, and you can imagine it'll take some time for Idaho or Nebraska or uh, uh, Oklahoma to shift into a different category. But that means that under the auspices of this state, all the territories that Israel actually rules are effectively part of the country. Uh, it, so if there is going to be someday a second state west of the Jordan, a Palestinian state in some pieces of territory, whether it's in Gaza or parts of the West Bank, the process of getting there will be a process of secession from Israel. It won't be a process of negotiating between an Israeli government and a separate Palestinian government that's a state on the way that's in territory not held by it, not a, not a part of Israel. That's the big difference. And then there are, my book goes into three major uh, factors that produced that change. But the fundamental thing is that change occurred. I, I want to ask about those factors, uh, but I also want to sort of clarify exactly how good the good old days were, um, because I actually loved every paragraph of this book, except the very first one that I almost didn't get past, <laughs> because it seemed to celebrate or at least condone what, correct me if I'm wrong, was a vicious, murderous ethnic cleansing uh, that created Israel uh, and to sort of constrain all criticism to the actions of later decades. Uh, and uh, I, I was I was wrong, I hope, in in that impression. Well, I, I'm looking at the first paragraph to find out what it was <laughs> that struck you that way. Uh, let, let's share it together and take a look. Uh, Zionists saw more clearly than anyone else the catastrophe facing the Jews of Europe and the need for a refuge. Their campaign to transform all or most of Palestine into a Jewish state succeeded in 1948. 
The Israeli-Palestinian conflict arose from that success and from two refusals. The first, when Israel that's, refused that's to allow three quarters of a million Palestinians to return to their homes, created the Palestinian refugee problem and ensured deep and continued challenges to its peace and security. Then I go into a second refusal after the 1967 war. But there's right. no question that I accept the fact that Israel, however you might value it or not value it, created in 1948, was created on the back of a massive act of ethnic cleansing. That was without, without the displacement of three quarters of a million Palestinian Arabs during the war, there would have been an equal number of Arabs and Jews in the state that the UN created. And we would not have had not only the reality of a Jewish state, but even the, the kind of image cherished by many Zionists that there was between 1948 and 1967, a cozy Jewish democratic state that didn't discriminate. No, my first book, my dissertation was on Arabs in the Jewish state, Israel's control of a national minority. Uh, thanks to the expulsion, displacement, and exclusion of the Palestinian refugees, Israel had a minority starting in 1948 of about 15%, now 20% uh, Arabs. It would have had a minority of 40 to 45% had that not occurred. And Israel used a military government to rule those people. They formally had citizenship, but they were very constrained. What I'm now saying is that after 50, uh, well, after 75 years, we see the, that Arab population, not because any government in Israel ever intended it, become a crucial player in Israeli politics. No, uh, the, the, the reason there was a government until recently that was not as extreme as others is because it could only be formed by including Arabs within it. The reason we're looking at the possibility of an unprecedentedly openly racist government being in, uh, arising in Israel is because Arabs are excluded from it. And now we see what's left of the Israeli left searching for ways to build an Arab Jewish party that effectively will not be Zionist. So. What I am seeing is the transformation of uh, uh, Israel from a, sm from a state that some could at least imagine as cozy, small, and Jewish into a large, non-democratic or partially democratic and a heterogeneous multicultural state in which the battle is, n is over democratization. What will it take and how long will it take for this new larger country that has as many or more Arabs in it and Jews to become democratic? Very good question. And, and can you be democratic and be devoted to a single religion? Uh, there's a Well, uh, probably not, unless you do it in an extremely formalized way, as in Britain, where the Anglican church is the official religion of Great Britain, but it has almost no meaning anymore for the lives of people in the country. Uh, the problem with trying to do that with Judaism or Islam is that there is no real separation of community, of ethnicity or nation and religion uh, when it comes to Jews or for the most, for, in many respects, when it comes to Muslims, there's a sense of a political community that's deeply invested in the concept of the Jewish people or the Muslim Ummah that is not present, at least not in recent incarnations of Christianity, certainly not of the Anglicans. We're, we're speaking with Ian Lustig about his book, Paradigm Lust, and I wonder if, if we could talk about some of the key factors that have that have created this one state uh, reality, as you call it. Well, I'm a political scientist and I'm a pretty serious student of history. And one of the things that I have learned is that people try to change their world in very specific ways, politicians, and they are often, they're often successful in the very short term in mobilizing resources and cleverly deploying them and getting what they want. But if you back away and look at what the results of what they did five or 15 or 25 years later, you find that 
Whatever little purposes they secured are overwhelmed by the unintended consequences of those supposed victories, which often lead in the other direction. So to take a very large example, the United States, uh, Lincoln, President Lincoln fought the Civil War to preserve a union. He never wanted uh, multiracial democracy. His, uh, insofar as he talked about what would be done with black slaves, they would go back to Europe. His main point was he was against miscegenation and s slavery encouraged miscegenation. I mean, he was, we don't know completely what he really thought, but that's what he said he thought. But the result of a union victory and the end of the occupation of the South was eventually through Jim Crow, through a racist Democratic Party, eventually a situation where Democrats couldn't get elected without securing black votes, which helped them, get, encourage them to protect voting rights for those that they never wanted in the country. Now, that kind of thing also explains how women get the vote. And there was never any plan the, uh, to do it, no agreement, no negotiations between uh, men and women to come finally come into a, an agreement. It was because some men wanted, thought they could get women's support against other men and women were demanding the vote. And this is the unintended consequences of democracy. So what do we see in Israel with respect to this? We see three things. One of them, uh, th three of the factors that I discuss in the book. One is de facto annexation, that the right in Israel has, from the 1967 on, sought to embed as many Jewish settlers in the West Bank and East Jerusalem and, and Gaza and Golan is possible to make it impossible for any government to divide the country and to create a, a Palestinian state, a two-state solution, or any kind of partition-based solution. The result of that effort has been successful. There are 700,000 Jewish settlers over the old armistice line. Back in the 1970s and early 80s, when I first started working on this problem, people said that there was a point of no return if there would be 100,000 Jews over the line. Israel would never be able to leave. That would be the end of the Palestinian state. And people said that all across, right-wingers, left-wingers. That was 100,000. It's now 700,000, and we will ask, hopefully we'll have time to talk about why do some Israelis still pretend, still talk about it as if that doesn't matter, but we have to do it. We have to get a state fast because pretty soon it'll be too late. But they, this is exactly what they were saying 50, uh, in, in 1980. So that was the unintended consequence of successful de facto annexation is to have a country with Actually, there are now more Arabs between the river and the sea than Jews. There are also half a million non-Jewish non-Arabs. So it's a complicated cultural landscape now. And when you have that kind of complexity, eventually, even a partial democracy produces the unintended consequences of drawing in the previously excluded. That's why Arabs are now have political parties and actually have been in the government and are so considered so important in Israeli politics when in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, they were ignored. They were man completely manipulated. Nobody even polled their opinions and opinion polls. So that's one item. Another factor is the Holocaust. It's not so much the Holocaust, the destruction of six million Jews, but the way it has been publicly remembered in Israel. And I have written extensively on this outside the book and inside the book to show how uh, different ways of remembering it have different political implications. So one way of remembering it is it was a, the greatest human rights catastrophe in history, the Nuremberg trials, never again for no one anywhere. And the Eichmann trial was based in part on that argument. But that particular way of understanding it uh, was discarded when Menachem Begin, the right-wing uh, uh, revisionist leader of Zionism, came to be prime minister in 1977, and he adopted uh, one of uh, another view, which is actually what the Holocaust is, is proof that the Gentiles are always out to kill us. 
And no matter where you look, and no matter what it may seem, deep down they're ready to kill us. And the Palestinians more than anyone else. So by hammering that theme, you generate what I call thousands of hyperlinks in the minds of Jews, including me, I'm a part of this, where if you hear the word gas, or you see a train, or you hear about carbon monoxide, or you see a barking dog, or you see the see a picture of barbed wire, all of this Holocaust stuff comes to your mind. And that attaches politically to an Im- making it extremely impossible politically and culturally for politicians to offer themselves as let's negotiate with a Gentile and trust them that actually an agreement with them will work. It's in that context amazing that as many Israeli initiatives to, to negotiate under the Labor Party and others have existed. That's really actually much more amazing than none of them work because of the unintended consequences of a of what for Begin was a a very savvy political ploy. Uh, although he personally felt that way, he was traumatized by the Holocaust himself. Now the third re, the third factor will be perhaps most interesting to your audience audience to our audiences because it has to do with the United States and it has to do with a huge unintended consequence. American Jews felt guilty about not being able to do very much at all to either stop the Holocaust or save Jews from Europe. When Israel was created, they essentially made a deal with Ben-Gurion saying, don't, we will not move to Israel and you will not keep telling us we have to move. And in return, we will give you money and political support. And so they founded the, what the Israel lobby incarnated mainly by an organization called APAC, American Israel Public Affairs Committee. And in the context of American politics, the particular way the founding fathers set up our government, a single issue movement is only devoted to one thing, to Israel's interest and to whatever the government of Israel says. APAC was able to achieve more power than any lobby in the United States, except perhaps the NRA or AARP and probably more. Uh, What that meant is the successive American governments, and I was in the government in the Carter administration, who wanted to pressure Israel, starting back with Nixon, wanted to pressure Israel toward a sensible agreement before it uh, it was too late with the Arabs, were prevented from doing so because their domestic advisors always said, if you do this, you will lose crucial support in the Congress and probably lose the election. And since no one really voted in for their congressman because they wanted to pressure Israel, Carter, Ford, Nixon, uh, uh, Obama, even in his second term, uh, the Bush uh, Bushes all backed away from things that they wanted to do. What was the re- unintended result of this? From APEC's point of view, they had secured an amazing victory. Israel's friends were always in charge. And uh, from in Israel's point of view, the right wing thought, well, there's nothing easier than manipulating the United States. That's actually a quote in the book. But what was the unintended result was that Israeli politicians that could have won elections based on the idea that we have a moderate, pragmatic way to solve the Arab-Israeli conflict, and the United States will support us. And if we don't do it, the United States will pressure us, so we'll lose more. They're, they were always shown to be wrong. Chulamit Aloni, Yossi Sarid, Chaim Ramon, all of these wonderful politicians flushed down the political toilet because the United States... Uh, uh, ended up producing a cocoon around Israeli democracy that made it impossible for Israelis to feel the future consequences of their uh, extreme positions that they took on settlement and toward the Arabs. So that unintended consequence of APAS success was to make Israel, to deflect it into a very right-wing incarnation of itself, much more right-wing and extreme than it would have been had APAC not been as successful as it was. I just finish this with one point, which will be striking. There are two, there are two issues in international politics, and only two, where the United States for 50 years has been three to four 
uh, uh, degrees of separate uh, 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 distributions away from the, the norm, away from the international norm, way over to the side. What are they? One is Israel. 145 countries vote one way, and the United States, Samoa, and Israel vote another way. What's the other issue? Cuba. The United States and Israel are the only countries that voted to maintain the boycott against Cuba, even though those are the two countries that oppose boycotts against Israel. What explains, what's the similarity between Cuba and Israel as issues in American politics? is that they both are identified with powerful, domestically crucial single-issue movements, the Cuban lobby, especially in Florida, and the Israel lobby, APEC. That shows you everything you need to know about how a small fact about American politics leads to this massive outcome unintendedly uh, in Israel. So Israel and APAC have in turn the United States into this disastrous uh, force for Israel uh, and having turned domestic opinion within Israel uh, into such hateful bigotry toward Palestinians uh, and having built all these settlements and having created all this polarization and segregation and uh, this, these are all factors that weigh against a two-state solution, but none of them seem particularly good for a one-state solution either, do they? All right. So one of the things you'll notice about the title of my book is it's not from two-state solution to one-state solution. It's from two-state solution to one-state reality. Now, I struggled for decades outside of my role as a scholar for a two-state solution. And what did I mean by that? I meant a prettier picture of the future that I know how to get to. I know it with a little American pressure, a left-wing victory in American elections, moderates continuing to control uh, uh, the center of gravity among Palestinians, and a negotiated solution supported by the Arab world that had endorsed it and Europe. And I think that looking back, uh, Oslo was something I predicted would occur. It had a probably by that time with a couple hundred thousand settlers in the West Bank, only a 20 to 25 uh, percent chance of, of actually succeeding. But I had a solution in the sense that I had a pretty picture and I knew how to get there. I knew a reasonable way to get there politically. Now I can generate all kinds of pretty pictures for, for the future including two states, I can imagine in my mind, or cantons, or a federation, or a confederation, or a one state for all its citizens. My trouble is I can't say any particular way to get there in a reasonable amount of time. So I don't call it a one state solution, but it is one state. People said it was impossible to have a one state. No, we've got one state. It's just not a democratic state. It doesn't mean it can't become democratic. And for that, we have to look and see how states that are partially democratic, South Africa before uh, or during apartheid, or the or most industrialized countries when women were excluded from the vote, or the United States before blacks had real political rights, or Britain before the Irish were allowed to vote, uh, in, uh, in Irish Catholics in the mid-19th century. We, we know that those processes take a long time and are not things that are planned and don't occur through negotiations. So we have a one state reality that incubates new possibilities. There are also very bad possibilities it incubates. We've seen in all the countries I mentioned, horrible oppression, sustained coercion, violence, slavery, and so on. But now, hopefully, we're living in a world which for all the struggles of uh, with authoritarian populism, liberal democratic norms can win out internationally. And if they do, Israel will be living in a world which over the decades, it will find very difficult to resist uh, the principles of democracy from working inside itself. I'm, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, Ian Lustig, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but a big part of finally getting some civil rights in the United States was nonviolent activism. Uh, and a big part of women getting the right to vote was women chaining themselves to the White House fence and starving themselves in prisons and being force fed. And so 
what assuming that 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 a one state solution is just ever so conceivable uh what should we be doing and what should we not be doing well i think that one thing to do first of all we are seeing that i mean among palestinians for decades there have been just resistance and planting olive trees and trying to protect their farms and semi-violent resistance with so with stones even with molotov cocktails and of violent resistance with guns and knives and it was a recrudescence of that there's uh we also see, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Jewish Arab uh, coalescing, uh, trying to leverage the fact that moderate Jews will never get power again unless Arabs are fully emancipated. In East Jerusalem, there are 330,000 Arabs who have the right to vote in Jerusalem elections but are not citizens of the country. And the palace, and there is an effort to get them to start voting in municipal elections to accept that there's a one-state reality, and that could turn the the, uh, Jerusalem municipality into a model of Arab-Jewish political success. Now, looking at it from the American point of view, I think it's extremely significant that the Biden administration doesn't make any bones about the fact that it's not about to start diplomatic initiatives uh, to to tilt against the windmill of a two-state solution. Instead, it has it, it may pay lip service a bit to that in principle, but it doesn't do anything towards it because it knows it never will work. Instead, it's used an interesting formulation that Palestinians and Israeli Jews have equal rights to safety, dignity, and prosperity. And defining the problem in Israel-Palestine as one of equality and democracy, Instead of occupation of another land, of decolonization, that is a big step forward. Americans can speak their mind about what should be done when Arabs are mistreated, are not treated equally, whether they live in the Galilee or in Judea and Samaria. And I'll I'll end with this interesting note. There were uh, some on the left who have objected to the fact that the American ambassador to Israel just went to an Israeli settlement to visit and console the families of a victim of a a Palestinian stabbed uh, a settler and killed him, a father of six. For the the United States used to not go to settlements, no representatives. We are going there now. And I see that as a good thing because we also go to the victims' homes inside the Green Line and outside the Green Line. That's treating also uh, Israeli uh, uh, mistreatment of Arabs on either side of the green line is equally open to our uh, assessment. So that we are now, we did also open an FBI investigation into the Israeli killing of the Palestinian journal, woman journalist in Nablus. And the Israelis yeah. are furious about that, but we are acting as if this is all one country and Israel is responsible for what happens there. The times they are changing. We've been speaking with Ian Lustig. The book is Paradigm Lost from Two State Solution to One State Reality. Thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you for having me, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.